and welcome to the Trend Talk. We are your hosts, Maradina Jaimes and Bell Hernandez. With Veterans Day just around the corner, we want to dedicate this episode to all the veterans, all the men and women who have proudly served our country. As a matter of fact, both our guests today are veterans and they are both television directors and producers. Our first guest served in the United States Air Force during the Vietnam War as crew chief on an F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber. After military service, he produced several award-winning documentaries highlighting Latino American service, including Guy Gabaldon, American Hero. We'll be talking to Alfredo Lugo. Then we talked to U.S. veteran and television director and executive producer Norberto Barba, known for his TV hits like Grimm, FBI, and Law & Order SVU. So don't go away. We'll be right back with Norberto Barba and Alfred Lugo. Our first guest, along with being named Veteran of the Month by Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, has given us a glimpse into the struggle, the glory, and the pride of Latino American service members through his amazing documentaries. We welcome Alfred Lugo. Hi, Alfred. Good morning. Good to see you, Alfred. Always good to see you. So I wanted to talk to you about this past week, there was a judicial hearing about the lack of Latino representation in Hollywood. And they mentioned uh, the subject of one of your documentaries, Guy Gabaldon. Uh, and Eddie was saying, Edward James Olmos, who was testifying, was saying that there's this great story about Guy Gabaldon that no one knows that he is a superhero. He is the military hero of the movie From Hell to Eternity, and he was brown-faced by an actor, an Anglo actor. So for our audience that doesn't know who Guy Gabaldon is and why he is so crucial, can you please tell us who he is? Guy grew up in East Los Angeles uh, in uh, around Skid Row and a Mexican-American, and uh, he was adopted by a Japanese family where he learned how to speak Japanese. Then he heard about uh, the Marines and he wanted to join the Marines. And uh, the Marines said, no, we don't need you. He tried the Navy and they said, no, they weren't accepting him. But he went back to the Marines and told them, look, I can speak Japanese. So they said, oh, we can use an interpreter. So that's when he joined uh, the Marine Corps and uh, he was sent to Saipan where he started seeing a lot of uh, Americans getting killed, especially his friends. Wasn't he able to, he was able to capture, or he, he was very instrumental in capturing some people there, right? Well, what he did, he, um, on his own, he uh, crossed the, the line and went into the enemy territory. And in, in Japanese, uh, you know, told some, uh, some of the Japanese to surrender to him, and uh, they did. Uh, he brought him into the camp, and uh, the commander told him, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. You're not allowed to do this. But uh, he, the following night, he did the same thing. He went out and captured uh, another four Japanese. But I had asked him, well, how are you able to multiply your capture? And he said, I would capture four. Then I would send two of them back and say, you bring me four more, and if you don't, I'm going to kill these two. And that's the way he was multiplying it. And one uh, one day he actually brought in 50 by himself. And then the most he ever brought in by himself was 800. That oh, he brought in. That is amazing. amazing. Now, see, uh, that's what the documentary talks about. But the, the thing that uh, he was recommended for the Medal of Honor, but... Uh, the Navy, as prejudiced as they were then, just gave him a silver star. And then that's when the movie that you spoke about, From Hell to Eternity, came out. And of course, six foot, blonde hair, blue eyed actor plays a little short 5'4 Mexican. And um, uh, so, anyway, uh, since the movie came out, the Navy, he said the Navy had a change of heart and wanted to upgrade the, the, Navy, to the silver star to a Navy cross, which is one medal below the Medal of Honor. And so that's why, that is why you decided to do a documentary on him because people needed to know that he was Latino and that this was a Latino contributing 
to the war, uh, World War II. So how did you decide to do the documentary? Well, before we talk about that, there's one very important thing that uh, hasn't come out, and that is that all the Japanese that he caught and he took in, he would take them into the intelligence officers. And what they did was they interrogated them and got a lot of information as far as how many Japanese were there, how much equipment they had, how much weapons, and how much food. That gave them information about the Japanese in the island, which, in other words, they saved a lot of marine lives because of that intel that he brought in. But nobody has said that. When you decided to do this documentary, tell us how it actually, um, how it got done at the station you were working at. You were working at a PBS uh, local television station and how the documentary came about. I met Guy Gavadon at a veteran conference or a veteran uh, event in Santa Ana. And so I went back to the station manager and, and station president and told them, look, I have an idea to do a half hour documentary uh, interview show with a guy Gavadon, and I explained who he is. Well, being that I'm a minority and I wasn't a producer, but uh, they felt it, they were pressured to do let a minority get some time. So they said, okay, uh, we'll think about it. The following day, they called me in, and this is what they gave me. They gave me three hours of studio time, and then I asked about editing time, and they said, well, you only have 10 hours of editing which any producer, writer would say, hey, we, we can't do a half hour documentary with that time limit. But I surprised them and what I did was I turned around and I says, you got it, I, I'll take it. And they thought because of the other shows that I produced, when I was producing in, in the cable, they decided, oh, it's just gonna be a cable program where we won't be able to air it, blah, 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 blah. Well, it come to find out it, it was, um, in the South Padre Island Film Festival, the San Diego Film Festival, and it was aired on several PBS stations. So, uh, you know, they they had to uh, air it themselves, in, and uh, they didn't think they could air it because they didn't think it was going to be PBS broadcast quality, which it was. Wow, well, that is such an amazing uh, accomplishment. And you also are quoted saying somewhere, uh, you know, you you had an opportunity to produce a film and you weren't a producer. You had an opportunity to direct a film and you weren't a director. You just really believed in this man's story, right? So you decided, yeah. I'm going to do it, right? Yes, yes. Uh, the, the same with uh, uh, the men of Company E. Uh, just reading about them. Uh, see, I had a book, Among the Valiant, which uh, a lot of stories of Mexican-Americans that fought in World War II, but these two stories really stuck out. And that's why I went after uh, doing the Men of Company E and also following up on Guy Gavadon. You are very involved with veteran organizations because being a veteran of the war, tell us a little bit about um, your where you were stationed and what was the what were you doing during the service, and then tell us about the organizations that you now support. I joined the Air Force. Um, as little kids, we always saluted the airplanes that were going over. And that's why we ended up joining the Air Force. And um, I was stationed at uh, Yokota Air Base in Japan, which we were crewing, and I was a mechanic and crew chief of F-105 fighter bombers. Now, the F-105 uh, didn't get much fame, but they did 80% of the bombing over Hanoi. So uh, uh, at the base... I, we were like a medevac base. We had a lot of wounded coming in. Uh, every day, like nine buses of, of wounded coming in. And if we had time off, we would try and go and help the ones that were in wheelchairs and take them to the mess hall so that they need. But I was picking out Latinos because I wanted to ask what their version and what they thought of Vietnam was you know, to them. And uh, I started getting stories, and that's how I ended up uh, getting mad and then uh, writing my documentaries. And then uh, I got more mad, and I wrote a poem, and then I got more mad, and then that's when I wrote uh, Roll Call. It's the effects of, of the Vietnam War on three Latinos and their girlfriends. What is Roll Call? Is Roll Call a film, uh, a TV show? What is it? 
Roll Call is a play. It was produced in 2007 in East Los Angeles for 14 performances. And then uh, uh, Real Hondo College decided to produce it. Now, right now, because of COVID, we're waiting until the COVID is over, where uh, it, it's going to be uh, produced on stage at the uh, Chamisal National Monument in El Paso, Texas. And and tell, us, tell us also what organizations you work with, because I know you're, you're, you're really concerned about veterans' rights, and there's other organizations that are support veterans. So tell us about some of those. Well, because I realized in looking at all the movies, I, I look around and says, "Hey, where are the Chicanos? Where are the Latinos?" And uh, and I know that every house that I went to in the family, they always had pictures, and most of my cousins were Marines. So I said, "Wait a minute! I know that they're fighting. How come I don't see them on television in the movies?" So that's what got me to do the positive images of Latinos, especially uh, veteranos. And uh, so I ended up joining uh, the uh, LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, and also the American GI Forum, and uh, also the VFW and other organizations like that. But the most active I'm at is with uh, American GI Forum in uh, trying to push, uh, you know, uh, issues that uh, veteranos and veterans are, are now having to deal with, especially especially high suicide rates and and the PTSD, the post traumatic stress syndrome, and uh, those are my interests in, in trying to get uh, help for the veterans. Then I I started uh, working with Joe Leal, who started Vet Hunters, and Vet Hunters goes their mission is to go out and search and rescue homeless veterans and get them off the street and help them get into the VA and get medical attention, get a home. Uh, and fed. Well, of course, we appreciate all that you're doing. Uh, and of course, we appreciate listening about your documentaries, but where can we see them? We want to know where we can see, uh, especially the Guy Gabandon story. You know, my good friend, Val, is making arrangements and Val could probably explain about that. Oh, yes, definitely. Because this documentary is so important, and we want people to know that Guy Gabaldon was not blonde and blue eyes. He was a short Mexican who could speak Japanese. So um, since it was uh, produced a while back, we, um, as our platform, Latin Heat Cinema, is going to be acquiring it and distributing it so that everyone who wants to see this documentary is able to do so. So it will be on in a week. Um, on latinheatcinema.com. So, Alfred, thank you so much for being on the Trend Talk. And when we come back, producer, director, Norberto Barba. Our next guest served in the U.S. Army Reserves, Special Forces Psychological Operations Unit. He's an awarded director and executive producer, having directed over 100 hours of episodic television on shows like Law & Order SVU, Grimm, and my personal favorite, Better Call Saul. Please welcome director, producer, Norberto Barba. Hello, hello. I'm very uh, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're excited to have you all the way from New York because you're busy getting ready to um, start the new season, shooting the new season. Is that correct? No, uh, we're already shooting the new season and we're already up to episode, uh, we're shooting episode two now and I um, started prepping episode three today uh, and we're in the thick of it. And uh, amidst the uh, COVID protocols, uh, we're so far knock on wood, everything's gone well. We're you were telling uh, me that you were, the high protocol, you know, uh, rules are in place and that you are really confident that um, this is going to work because of all that you've done to prepare. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's all, you can read up about it and uh, some of the guilds have written up about it, but basically we have, we use zones, there's zone A and zone B, and then within those zones, there are pods, and then someone like me, that's zone A, we, I get to go everywhere, uh, I could be with the actors, I can be with everybody, but I get tested every day. Mm. And, uh, and the actors get tested every day. Uh, and so anyone who has interaction with the actors has to get tested every day. And then there's, uh, you know, social distancing. And then if you're with the actors, you, everyone has to wear a mask everywhere. I'm inside my office, so I'm okay. But 
I have my mask. And then when I'm near the, the actors, I have my shield mm. with, the, with the mask. And, uh, um, you know, we're shooting outside now. And I wanted to ask you, um, the way we met was years ago um, when you did um, a project for a Universal. Right. So can you give us a little bit of background on how that you started to really take off as a director? Because that was back in... That was a short film that Universal Television uh, with the National Hispanic Media Coalition um, sponsored. And it was pretty much a nationwide contest where you submit a script, a half hour script. And if you got selected, they would select two a year. Uh, you would do a half hour movie and uh, you, the major sponsors would be Panavision, Kodak, um, Universal. And, uh, and then after you did it, they would screen the film uh, at Universal a couple of nights. And uh, thank, thankfully I, I won with a, a script called Chavez Ravine, which was a fictitious story of, uh, that uh, took place during uh, the 19, early 1950s. Uh, late 40s, uh, where there's a neighborhood in Los Angeles called Chavez Ravine that used to be a shanty town, uh, mostly Mexican Americans. And uh, there, there was an evolution of that neighborhood back uh, in, uh, in the early 1900s where they were trying to get rid of um, shanty towns and there was a drive against poverty. And so they, uh, they moved a lot of those folks, but uh, a bunch of families stayed and then because they were they were going they were supposed to knock down those those houses and build projects, but they never did. So the family stayed. But then the Dodgers came and said, "Well, now we want this. Let's get these families out of here." So the Dodgers paid the city of Los Angeles one dollar, and for that land, and uh, it was a trade for another piece of land they owned in South Central, uh, and uh, they bulldoze these houses down because the people wouldn't leave. They were multi-generational there and they felt that uh, uh, eminent domain really wasn't fair. So how, how did that impact your career? Did that get you noticed? And then well, what happened was, so, uh, so I, I, you know, the story I told about a family that was there and uh, how they came together to fight. So that short film was shown in a screening and a company saw it and that night, next day, I got offered a feature film, uh, and uh, which doesn't happen. I was just in the right place at the right time. And it was a movie uh, uh, that was um, an action revenge thriller. And uh, I thought at the time, wow, how can you equivocate uh, what was basically an American playhouse sort of dra family drama with this action revenge thriller? And they said, well, we saw you could tell a story and with limited resources. And this is a story uh, of, a, of a mother who loses a child in the crossfire of a, of a, of a gang war uh, with Japanese m mobsters and, uh, and Americans. And uh, so uh, we made the movie, Virginia Madsen was the lead, Harry Dean Stanton, Michael wow. Madsen. And so uh, it's somewhat of a little cult thing. You can find it on, Amazon Prime or IMDb, and it's called Blue Tiger. And so that was my first movie in 1992. Uh, that was 94, I think. And then that led to uh, a, a studio movie called Solo with Mario Van Peebles and uh, Adrian Brody. And, um, and then that led to TV movies. Uh, and then I did several, three TV movies, and then I started doing episodic. Uh, but uh, yeah, and so I, I kept doing, I was doing different shows. I loved jumping around, you know, kind of you're a gun for hire, and, you, and then you, you do, they, they talk about uh, uh, production camps. So you have the Jerry Bruckheimer camp, you have, you know, the, the uh, Kelly camp, you have, you know, Aaron Sorkin camp, you have, you know, uh, and so at the Dick Wolf camp. And so I managed to jump around camps. And so in the camp, if you do one good episode, I did like a CSI Miami. Well, I did well. I did, ended up doing 10 uh, CSI New Yorks, you know, and then with, with here, I started with criminal intent. And then I ended up doing all the law and orders and other Dick Wolf shows. And then actually my first producing directing job was law and order criminal intent. 
Mm. And then after that, uh, and then that was a different thing because what that's about is when you direct, you direct an episode, you're focused solely on that episode. As a director producer, I'm focused on the whole season, on the whole show. My job is to protect the show, to actually uh, uh, be the intermediary between the writers and production and to, uh, to, to execute in the best way I can the written word that they gave us and to, uh, uh, to work, collaborate and work, well, work together so that we see the arc of the season. And so I, I uh, am one of the people involved in hiring the directors. And, uh, and also I have a, a strong hand in the look of the show, in, um, in the sets, in the palette, in, in, in you know, casting, uh, locations. And so I have a hand in everything. And I just don't think about that one episode. Uh, I think about, okay, what about the episode before and after? Where am I going to, where, where are we going 10 episodes from now? Mm -hmm. you know, like last year, I wanted to actually take the look of the show and make it uh, grittier. And I wanted New York to be more of a character. And I wanted to have more tension in the visuals. And, but I knew that I can't just splash that in the first episode. So what I did was little by little, working with the directors, you kind of move it in the direction. And you can see, if you saw the first episode last season that I, uh, that I directed, and the last episode of last season, you can see the, the, uh, the seeds of the visual style in that first episode that actually had, had become a, a sort of a fresh and more expanded uh, vision by the well, It seems like your vision works, yes. Alberto, because <laughs> you recently I'm, were, uh, you got a, a Mahin Award. Yeah, I'm very proud of that, very happy about that. Uh, or Better Call Saul. Yeah, right? not Better really Call Saul, my favorite show. Oh, great, great. <laughs> but oh. I wanted to really pivot really oh. quick um, to your service, you are a veteran, and as we're, you know, we're celebrating Veterans Day in a couple of days, so uh, tell me a little bit about your experience yes. as a veteran. I uh, just got into the AFI, but I wasn't going to start till I think it was uh, to that fall, and it was earlier, and it was now February or something, and no, it was October of the year before, and, uh, and I thought, you know, I they have this program to help pay back student loans. And I've always had this, this attraction to uh, the military. Um, and um, so I thought I joined, I joined. And uh, I went to basic training that, that February, uh, that February and um, in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and then um, returned to LA and started going uh, a week and a month and two weeks in the summer. Uh, and I would report and I was in a group called uh, there were it was a psychological uh, unit psych psychological um, uh, operations unit and um, their model was a mind is a wonderful thing to waste uh, <laughs> that was, so. oh I get it though it's not funny but it yeah, sounds but, funny. yeah based on that commercial right and the idea is that uh, it's almost like a propaganda uh, wing, you know, uh, you, when you, they, they, you can use the word PSYOP as a verb. Oh, we PSYOP that, that mm -hmm. those people, you know, whatever. And they were heavily used in the Iraqi uh, war and the uh, Gulf War, uh, Desert Storm and all that. And basically you try to win the hearts and minds of the people uh, that you're fighting and all that. Mm -hmm. And, um, so we, do, we run radio stations, we do films. Well, you seem to have had a fascinating life in all areas of your life. <laughs> and it's fascinating to hear all these stories that I'm sure you probably draw from in your work now. But, you know, we want to thank you so much because um, you are a veteran and we wanted to celebrate Veterans Day with right. someone who has served in the Army and who is doing some fantastic work in Hollywood. Yes. Congratulations on all. Thank you. And we'd like to know if you would like to send a message to your fellow Latino American veterans. Yes, definitely. First of all, thank you for your service. And know that we hold all of you in our hearts and we're thankful. Uh, a lot of times, um, you know, we, 
we get, we're not mentioned, you know, or people, folks may forget that we served. And it's a reminder that you don't, to serve is an honor and, uh, and we don't take it lightly. And I want to thank all, especially Latino Americans and those who, who serve, who are undocumented, who are looking to a pathway to citizenship and that there's struggles with that now, but not only uh, do you deserve it, you know, I will do everything to make sure that we can make, uh, that there's a path to citizenship through service. Thank you so much, Norberto. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, Maravina. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much, Norberto. And we'll be right back with our Trend Talk Trendsetter shout out. Today, our Trend Talk Trendsetter shout out goes to the VA Center for Minority Veterans, which provides essential information about benefits for all of our veterans of color. For more information, contact the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, VA Center for Minority Veterans. We want to thank our guests for being on the Trend Talk show. Also, again, we want to celebrate all our veterans who have served our country proudly. Thank you so much for your service. And we also want to remind you to follow us on Instagram at The Trend Talk Show because you know if it's trending, we're talking. talking.